dear friends, uh, dear colleagues from embassies, NGOs from all over the world, um, warm welcome to the 16th International Helvis Villa Seminar, My Body is Mine, Legislation, Consent and Women's Rights. Helvi Sipila was a Finnish lawyer, diplomat, and the first female assistant secretary general of the UN. And this uh, seminar series is named after her. It addresses challenging issues that affect women and their lives locally and globally in the 21st century. And this event is indeed the 16th seminar in this series. And this time our topic is sexual violence against women. Sexual violence is a serious uh, human rights violation and is recognized as a form of gender-based violence under international law. The Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the CEDAW Convention, requires state parties to take all appropriate measures to counter it. And the CEDAW Committee recommends that the definition of sexual crimes is based on the lack of freely given consent. So during the next one and a half hours, our distinguished speakers will examine the question of sexual violence as a human rights violation and explore measures needed to counter it. This webinar is organized jointly by five women, uh, Finnish women's organizations. The Finnish Federation of Graduate Women, the National Council of Women of Finland, the Coalition of Finnish Women's Associations, NUTKIS, uh, Finland National Committee for UN Women and the Young Women's Christian Association of Finland. My name is Maria Kahkunen. I am Advocacy Coordinator in the National Council of Women of Finland and I will be your host today. Regarding technicalities, our webinar is held as a Zoom meeting, so we kindly ask our participants to keep their cameras off and microphones muted. Uh, however, we encourage you to use the chat for discussion and comments. If we have time at the end of the program, we can take one or two questions from the chat as well. Um, for speakers, we would be happy to also see your face during um, your speech, if possible. You have also noted that we are now recording this webinar and we will send a link uh, to the recording to participants after the event. So, without uh, further ado, let us begin with the program. We have interesting speakers today and I hope you will enjoy the discussion. The opening remarks uh, will be given by the Minister of Justice of Finland, Anna Maya Henriksson. Uh, she has led the preparations for uh, the Finnish uh, consent-based legislative reform for the last years. And uh, we will be happy to hear her words on that regard. Unfortunately, Minister Hendrickson was not able to join us in person, so we will see her mar remarks on the video. Dear audience, ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor to be talking to you about the measures Finland has recently taken to address violence against women, which is a serious human rights problem in Finland, like in so many countries. This subject is very important to me, and I'm glad to be able to talk about it to you today. Violence against women is regrettably common in Finland. According to a study published by the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights 2014, Finnish women experience violence considerably more often than women living in EU countries on average. 47% of Finnish women aged 18 to 74 who responded to the survey had experienced physical or sexual violence after 15 years of age. 30% had experienced physical or sexual violence from their current or former partner after 15 years of age. 
Over the past year, 5% of Finnish women had experienced physical or sexual violence by a former or current partner. These figures are far too high. I'm pleased to say that the current government pays particular attention to personal integrity and the reduction of crimes against life and health, especially crimes against children and intimate partner violence. The government has launched several legislative and other projects aimed at improving the status of crime victims, addressing violence and increasing equality. I will now present some of these. According to the government program, an action plan for combating violence against women will be prepared. This action plan was published in October 2020. The plan contains altogether 32 measures and the implementation of the action plan is proceeding as planned. In accordance with the current government's program, a working group was appointed in March 2020 to assess broadly the range of ways available to improve the effectiveness of restraining orders, reduce the incidence of violations of restraining orders and improve the safety of victims of intimate partner violence in particular. The report of the working group was published in September 2021 and the preparation is still ongoing based on the professional statements given to the report. A project is underway at the Ministry of Justice to prepare clarification of the criminal code as regards to criminalization of female genital mutilation. In addition, the Ministry of Justice has completed an assessment uh, memorandum on the need for a separate criminalization of forced marriage. But however, one of the biggest and historically most important legislative projects of the government is the comprehensive reform of legislation covering sexual offences. The reform will reinforce the right to physical integrity and to sexual self-determination. The major advancement is that the definition of rape will be based on absence of consent. The victim does not always fight back or actively oppose the offender. Consent-based rape law is the necessary step for recognizing these realities of rape and for ensuring the victims' rights fully. Finland will soon join those countries that have already modernized their relevant legislation. We have already seen very encouraging results from those countries. For example, in Sweden, where a similar legal reform was done in 2018, reports to the police and sentences for rape have increased significantly. This shows that consent-based rape laws can improve the victim situation and the pursuit of justice also in practice. In our reform in Finland, also several other parts of the laws will be improved. Sexual off offences against children will be defined so that the invulnerability of children is fully recognized, both offline and online. In addition, amended rules on sexual harassment and unlawful distribution of sexual images will better address current forms of offensive behavior committed in the Internet. This reform is now in its final stages. A government proposal for new legislation 
was passed to the parliament very recently. And our aim is that the new legislation will be in force from the beginning of the year of 2023. So, dear ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you and I wish you a good seminar day. The topic is very important and I'm sure you will have very inter interesting discussions. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much for Minister Hendrickson for outlining the actions that the Finnish government is taking to tackle sexual violence against women. As we heard, um, the ministry has been quite busy recently on the issue. And we are, of course, happy to hear that. Next, I would like to give the floor to the president of the National Council of Women of Finland, uh, Sara Sofia Sire. She leads the umbrella organization of uh, 72 Finnish women's organizations, and uh, she will give a comment uh, from the perspective of Finnish women's organizations. Sara Sofia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you to the Minister. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this International Helvisipila Seminar um, with that topic, um, My Body is Mine. I would especially like to welcome our international participants, guests and speakers. Um, for example, to mention uh, representatives of uh, equality now uh, from different continents. All of us have the timely security concerns and issues on top of our minds at the moment due to the brutal war and humanitarian crisis at the moment um, in Ukraine not to forget other crises and uh, worrying situations linked to women's rights and human rights um, around the world. This is um, especially um, an important time to remember the importance of equality work, the work that uh, we all do and uh, we all know and acknowledge that equality has a direct link to stability, uh, stability and, and peace. Today's topic is uh, my body is mine, like mentioned. Um, every woman's uh, body is hers uh, during war, during peace, in all situations, at every age. We know that sexual violence against women is a problem everywhere in the world. It is a problem also here in Finland, uh, even though we we see ourselves uh, and are are proud of uh, the situation that is is good in uh, terms of equality uh, in, in one of the most equal countries in in the world. But it is a big uh, problem. It is important to highlight that sexual violence is a form of violence against women. It is a human rights violation. Uh, Finland, of course has committed to combating sexual violence against women uh, by international treaties that Finland has uh, ratified. And we just heard from the, the minister uh, that, uh, that, that uh, what kind of uh, steps the current government is taking on, on tackling this, uh, this topic. Um, many of you are aware of the international treaties just to mention uh, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, which requires uh, us to take all appropriate measures to counter gender-based discrimination, which, of course, sexual violence is uh, part of on, and included in, in this treaty. Another one very familiar to, to the audience for sure is the Istanbul Convention, uh, the Council of Europe uh, Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic uh, Violence, uh, which defines sexual violence as non-consensual uh, non acts of sexual nature. And these international treaties are binding Finland, which means that Finland has a legal obligation 
to uh, define uh, sexual uh, offenses based on, on consent. And this is why the topic of today's seminar is so timely and so important. This legislation, uh, this legislative reform um, that the minister uh, mentioned on uh, sexual offenses um, is very important. And we have been waiting for this uh, legislation uh, for, for quite some time. Women's organizations, including the National Council of Women of Finland, have advocated for this reform for a long time. It, ha it has been of high prior priority in, in our work. This uh, new law would improve women's bodily integrity and sexual self-determination. The law that Minister Hendrickson just uh, presented is currently debated in the Parliament of Finland. So uh, the members of the Parliament are, are working on the legislation at this very moment. The National Council of Women has influenced uh, on the reform during uh, its uh, preparation and um, it has improved during the process along the way uh, towards um, the kind of law that we have been uh, working for. Um, however, there are still some uh, details and uh, one uh, bigger issue we'd like to underline and then and we are currently working on to change during the, the parliamentary uh, work taking place at the moment. All situations of sexual intercourse without consent should be defined as rape. And this is um, not uh, the case in, in the law that is presented for the, the parliament at the moment. So we are still uh, working for this to be uh, changed, the, the proposal to be changed in this uh, respect. Surely we'll go more into details uh, during, during this uh, seminar. The discussion that we are about to hear is an important opportunity for us to learn from the experiences of uh, other countries, other organizations, NGOs around the world, how uh, they have made this kind of reforms, um, how they have been influenced uh, on, on the ground. A consent-based law is needed. And uh, currently we are uh, taking really important steps uh, towards uh, this aim. And after we have a new law, it must be infor enforced in practice to affect change, actual, actual change in, in women's lives and, and to strengthen uh, women's uh, rights. I am very much looking forward to the discussions to um, the presentations and the discussion to, to follow. Once again, uh, it's my great pleasure to, to welcome all of you and uh, let's get to the important and timely agenda. Thank you, Sarah Sophia, uh, very much for your thoughts on this important reform on sexual. Uh, offenses. We hope that it will be finalized soon in the Parliament. We now turn our gaze into the global situation of sexual violence against women and the keynote speech uh, of today will be delivered by the amazing expert of sexual violence and legislation, Jackie Hunt, who is the global lead of ending sexual violence at Equality Now. Her topic is sexual equality, the importance of consent-based definitions of rape. Very much welcome, Jackie. The floor is yours. Thank you, Maria. Thank you so much for the honor of inviting me today to give this address. It's been so rewarding for me, both personally and professionally, collaborating with colleagues in Finland over the past couple of years. And I've learned so much from, from our exchanges. And congratulations, too, to the National Council for the, for the changes that they've managed to accomplish already in the sexual violence legislation. 
My body is mine is an important statement of rights, of course. Laws around the world, and particularly today's focus laws on sexual violence, do not always respect this right of bodily autonomy and implementation of these laws even less so. So we all know that rape has largely been ignored as an issue worldwide in all of our countries. It happens in such epidemic proportions that, and your minister has just even mentioned violence against women and, and, the, and the huge toll it takes on all our societies. Um, and if it were a disease such as the type we all have distressingly recently experienced, it would have the serious attention and the funding to address it. Um, as it is, rape has largely become part of the wallpaper in all our countries and there's not enough being done to properly address it. The vast majority of victims of rape are women and almost all perpetrators are men and policies and practices need a gendered approach in order to address the injustice inherent in the system, in all our systems. It's not possible to understand how discrimination in rape laws came about without understanding the context of gendered roles and stereotypes. But of course, those roles and stereotypes also negatively impact minoritized genders as well as men. And it is crucial that the law works to deliver justice for everybody. But to get at the root causes of these issues, we need to see how stereotypes continue to, to frame the way the laws are written. So Equality Now in 2017, with the assistance of very many lawyers from around the world, studied laws on rape in 82 legal systems and saw several trends in the way laws were framed, not in all laws, but with strong patterns showing. So these included that rape is indicated to be an issue of morality rather than one of violence. That is, it's more an offense against a woman or a girl's chastity. So not so much against her and her bodily integrity, but rather a crime that offends society and the role it has ascribed her to be so-called to be pure. So even when that isn't written into the law, we see in all our societies a tendency to evaluate the innocence or complicit guilt of the victim, depending on her identity, what she'd been wearing, whether she'd been drinking, what had she been doing when she was attacked, was she out late at night? If she isn't what is deemed to be an innocent victim, public sympathy and with it her ability to access justice also melts away. Similar negative stereotypes feed judicial discretion when the law allows judges to reduce charges or define what constitutes evidence. So for example, charges in Bolivia regarding rape of adolescent girls are frequently reduced because common perceptions are that the underage girl seduced her adult perpetrator and therefore he should not feel the full force of the law because she was to blame. Or a judge in Iran believing that so-called nice girls wouldn't go out without a chaperone at night, and if they did, again, they would be inviting attack. So a, a perpetrator in several jurisdictions can be exempt from punishment, even under the law, by reaching a settlement, financial or otherwise, with the victim or the victim's family. In Equality Now's experience, the settlement is largely made between the families without the victim ever having a say or receiving any form of compensation. This often makes her feel further worthless without the support of those closest to her and cements her position in a hierarchy that already gives her little value or control. The most extreme form of law in this respect is the so-called marry your rapist law, when a perpetrator is exempted from punishment if he marries his victim, whereas she in those circumstances faces a life of repeated rape and again no bodily autonomy. This is another misplaced manifestation of woman as a channel for her family or her community or her society's so-called honour, but it indicates more than that. It also shows women as objects to be bartered and as possessions. In that context then, it makes perfect sense that where there are no laws against marital rape, the logic being that once a woman is married, she moves into her husband's possession to control as he wishes. 
The logic of these laws based around a woman's purity also results in force-based definitions of rape. These are laws that require significant violence to be used before rape can be proven. The logic is if a woman doesn't fight back, she must have wanted sex. This allows no room for any understanding of a victim being frozen, fearful, exploited, or coerced. The onus is on the woman effectively to prove she doesn't want sex and to actively resist it, and not on the man to ask if she wants sex and not ignore her wishes. And this resistance of a so-called pure woman is best shown if she incurs physical injuries. The German justice minister in 2016 said at the time in German law, there was no clear answer as to how much resistance a woman had to offer for an offense to constitute rape based on that definition. Does she need to be killed or severely beaten? Who decides what is the right amount of harm a woman has to suffer before she can be said to have been raped and to be able to access justice. Thankfully, international human rights thinking has moved on considerably and national governments, including the Finnish government, which is very welcome news, have a better understanding and, uh, about this issue and also generally about promotion of women's equality and they are catching up. Only genuine willing consent will do. A woman needs to have the choice over her own body. As we've heard from Sarah and Nehia, UN Women Guidelines and Jurisprudence from the CEDAW Committee, as well as the group of experts reviewing compliance with the Istanbul Convention, among others, state that what is needed is either laws that insist on the unequivocal and voluntary agreement and requiring proof of, that the accused took steps to ascertain whether the complainant was consenting or not, or that the act take place in coercive circumstances and that the law includes a broad range of coercive circumstances that show what is meant. As the former UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women set out in her model law last year, this could include examples ranging from if the victim was intoxicated as a result of drugs or alcohol, or where the perpetrator is in a position of power, trust, influence, or dependency over the victim and may have taken advantage of that position to force participation. So that might also include in the home, in an institution, or a professional or occupational setting. The strong important message is that the sole criteria for consensual sex is genuine, willing and voluntary consent itself. A person's body is theirs and no one else's. Only they have ownership over it and anything other than welcome sex is not welcome and therefore a breach of bodily integrity. For the law to ensure consent is given voluntarily as a result of a person's free will, it must be assessed in the context of the surrounding circumstances, and it must be absolutely clear what consent looks like. The group of experts under the Istanbul Convention has criticized Spanish law, for example, which provides for a separate crime of rape, and then one of sexual abuse with penetration. This, the expert said, illustrates an improper understanding of, on the one hand, the use of force, and on the other, a use of intimidation uh, and real understanding of this issue requires one law focused on consent with a context sensitive interpretation of the situation the victim finds herself in. The explanatory report of the Istanbul Convention says that such an assessment must recognize the wide range of behavioral responses to sexual violence and rape which victims exhibit and shall not be based on assumptions against assumptions, stereotypes and myths of what typical behavior would be in such, in such situations. It's equally important to ensure that interpretations of rape legislation and the prosecution of rape cases are not influenced by gender stereotypes and myths about female and male sexuality. So the first action by governments must be a law with a strong unequivocal consent-based definition and an indication of where consent must be especially investigated, for example, where there is a position of trust. 
and evidence about consent must be properly gathered, including what steps a perpetrator took to be sure that his partner was consenting, moving away from the constant focus on the victim and looking for anything that might blame her for the abuse and instead fully investigate the context and the actions of the accused. Definitions of rape should take into account the continuum of coercion too within which sexual assault may occur, which might include intimate partner relationships. And of course, most uh, rape happens in the context of a known partner. Since laws worldwide about rape have, been, have arisen as a result of these deeply entrenched negative stereotypes about women's sexuality, it follows that those attitudes are still embedded deeply in our societies, including and especially in our law enforcement. It is not enough to amend the law. It is vital that any legislative measures are supported by public and law enforcement education, particularly to counter negative gender and other stereotypes. What's also needed then is training and awareness raising more generally about the pitfalls officials in the train can be drawn into. In collaboration with the Council of Europe, UN Women and the authorities in Georgia, Equality Now has just completed a manual for the investigation, prosecution and adjudication of sexual violence crimes. The manual also encourages law enforcement to look at the additional vulnerabilities of those with further marginalized status, such as women with disabilities, ethnic minority women, women in prostitution, homeless or migrant women, drug users, minoritized genders, and so on, to leave any preconceptions at the door and to focus solely on true sought for evidence rather than any officer's negative perceptions about whether a woman is rapeable or deserves justice. Such an approach means having determined political will to address sexual violence holistically with an adequate budget, including to support survivors. Women's rights organizations have been working long and hard on this issue for many years. Survivors and their advocates know what must be done. Governments are slowly catching up, but with rape having virtually been decriminalized in so many of our countries and victims reluctant to come forward, fearing they will be re-victimized and not get justice, we must work together to send a very strong signal that rape is unacceptable and will be punished. This is not just about sexual violence, just. <laughs> but about women's equality more broadly. Women need to know just, not just that their bodies are theirs so that they can participate freely in life, knowing that the integrity of their being is also respected by the societies of which they are part, but that they will be protected by the governments who are there to serve all their citizens and that their rights will be equally upheld and promoted. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jackie Hunt, for this very comprehensive, very interesting uh, outline of um, the best practices of consent-based legislation all over the world. And I really do hope that that governments uh, in many, many countries do hear also your words and your message uh, about the, um, the legislation and, and how it should look like if it is to truly um, ensure that women's human rights are respected and women do have a say of their own bodies. It is now time to turn to our panel discussion. And in the panel, we will explore more in the detail the means uh, needed to tackle the joint challenge of sexual violence against women, uh, such as legislation, education, cooperation and negotiation. We will hear about the situation of sexual violence against women in different contexts and outline the solutions which have emerged from grassroots activism as well as from international cooperation. And hopefully best practices will emerge and about the tools that work best for ensuring that women around the world can enjoy their personal integrity, both in peace and in conflict. We have three excellent panelists and we will start with introductory remarks uh, from each of them. Um, first, Puya Mandal uh, is the Young Women Lead at Young Women's Christian Association of India and a public health and gender rights professional. 
uh, Puya, how does the situation of sexual violence against women look like in India and how does it affect young women and their health? And what are the solutions advocated by the civil society and do you see them leading to a change? Uh, hello everybody, good evening. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Uh, my name is Pooja uh, and uh, thank you so much um, for this opportunity, I would just like to um, express my gratitude that how big of a opportunity it is to speak in such a uh, space and with such esteemed guests because um, I feel that India brings a very different context because of our societal structures and uh, and the authenticity of our culture and how uh, how is violence perceived in our country. Uh, so um, I would want to begin with mentioning a few facts, but I will not be talking a lot in terms of facts. I will be focusing more on my experiences as a grassroots social worker who has been working in the space of, uh, of gender and uh, uh, public health. So um, when you go see the data by National Crime Records Bureau, they mention in the 2019 report that rape is the fourth most common crime in India. Uh, 32,033 cases of rape have been registered in India in 2019. But we have to focus on the word registered because what we have to understand is that is the number that has been given to us by registration of these cases in local police stations, which is a struggle altogether in our country because it's so inaccessible to uh, reach for, for a victim to reach a police station and file a complaint. Moving forward, we have to discuss that why is this an issue in our country? Because in our society, because we come from such a regressive um, conservative society, sex is a taboo. We don't talk to our children. We don't talk to our elders. There is no discussion about sex in our uh, families. Neither is the context of violence. And when this is linked, does like there is rampant sexual violence beginning from households which go unmarked and which are never registered. So whatever data that are given to us are again fabricated and are not complete data that is captured. We move on, we see that uh, one woman dies per hour in terms of diary by uh, again, uh, dowry, again by data of National Crime uh, Records Bureau of 2020. And this shows that a, 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 viol, a, a, a harassment or violence uh, which has been criminalized in the country is still so prevalent. And now it has taken new, it has modified itself with, with the moving culture. We have modified the word dowry into gifts and it has it has so um, um, it has so uh, rapidly gotten uh, embedded into this culture. We have to talk about when uh, when these conversations about sexual violence go unregistered in families. It's uh, women are taught in our culture to be subversive and to and in all cases of such sexual violence and sexual harassment are hushed in in our in our country's context because your uh, uh, your uh, ability to be pure and pious is what is respected about you the most in our country so uh, when and then moving forward when we link it to how it affects the mental health and the overall health of young women in our country so we have to understand that though there are a lot of uh, uh, legislations and schemes and acts in place in this country in the in the last 10 years there has been a rapid change yes but we have to understand that are they actually working? Do they actually serve the purpose? Um, when we go into the ground, we see that it does not. And the biggest reason for it is that, that 
primary healthcare workers are not sensitized enough to handle such cases of trauma and violence and this leads to miss a lot of misinformation a lot of judgments that any victim would um uh you know have to go through to actually go and seek help which further discourages young women to actually uh, talk about what has happened with them and another point of concern is that uh, there aren't any uh, um, strong um, governmental support to there is a ministry of uh, uh, women and child welfare but it does not focus entirely on on women's rights and and the necessity of criminalizing sexual violence and yes for this there ha has been a very strong and a very um, uh, uh, a very um, how how do i put it um, it has been like a, a storm how women's rights organizations have taken this into their hands to bring change into the legislation but also bring change in terms of how our society thinks so for example um we have one stop centers which are trauma centers who uh, cater to uh, victims uh, legal aid and um, their uh, complaint registrations and rescuing them if they are in a situation of um, uh, where they can be harmed in any manner so there are these centers but there are pros and cons to again to these centers as well because some of these centers where are proper sensitizations done and they have a training and proper they are properly equipped to handle cases these centers are run very well and they provide immense support to young women but on the other hand if if these centers are again run by um um workers and um, uh, health workers or social workers who are from that pre uh, prejudiced mindset it hampers to the welfare of the young women which is which also leads to a lot of um self harm uh, and uh, suicide risk and unsupervised or misinformed uh, procedures that young women go through so that they don't have to actually um discuss whatever they are going through with their families or their friends because of the stigma there is so much stigma around um around any kind of harassment or sexual violence and uh, we we do not have in our culture where we sit with um our families or friends and we have this discussion about what are healthy healthy relationships that conversation goes missing and we even when we are um talking about uh, um women's rights a, a lot of the panels as our uh, earlier speakers also mentioned and uh, um that these panels are again um they are uh, represented by men of the organizations or there are women's rights organizations who have uh, boards and uh, trustees or funding uh, 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 individuals who are men and then they there there comes a fabricated uh, viewpoint a lot of times because uh, because in our society we are again um we intend to think that yeah, A, a woman is not as intelligent or cannot make as logical decisions as a man for like for the biggest example that i um, was very anxious for today's uh, session webinar is because inherently we have for for we uh, as women have been taught that we shouldn't be capturing spaces we shouldn't be loud and bold and uh, and when that happens uh, there comes a lot of um, pushback from the community itself so um, there so again for this the a lot of civil society organizations are uh, working on awareness programs and sensitization campaigns regarding sexual violence and violence against women and gender based violence in specifically with uh, young men and boys uh, and talking about uh, patriarchal structures and and the concept of masculinities and how does that affect a young child's 
uh, ideas and thought processes when they are growing up. And uh, another thing which we see in our Indian civil society structures is that uh, there is a lot of focus on language. There is a lot of focus on working on uh, gender neutral language. So when we are working with uh, uh, young children or, or teenagers and giving them the idea of a gender neutral world that they need to work towards instead and break barriers in their homes and to begin from standing up and speaking, um, speaking against it, uh, against violence from their homes itself, because I feel that that is the biggest um, uh, issue for our uh, country in terms of sexual violence that young women, women, girls face, that the, that the biggest um, a topic of conversation here is that we need to start working with families, intimate partners, and that is what is missing. So these are my opening remarks and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Priya, and uh, thank you very much for uh, for being here. We are very happy to, to have you here and uh, hear your views on the matter. And next, we have Clara Berilund. Uh, you are the Secretary General of of the Swedish Women's Lobby, and you have closely followed the Sweden's constant-based legislative reform, which was introduced some years ago. And um, we would like to very much hear from you how how you made that happen, and uh, do you see that it has changed the lives of women who uh, who encounter sexual violence? And uh, what can countries which are contemplating uh, similar legislative reforms uh, learn from your experience? <laughs> Thank you, Maria, and uh, thank you also for inviting uh, me and the Swedish Women's Lobby. So we are an umbrella organization for the women's movement in Sweden. Um, so the sexual offenses legislation in Sweden uh, was reformed in 2018. Um, and the changes meant that the rape law was to be based um, upon the absence of consent uh, instead of the occurrence of violence, threat or a particularly vulnerable situation, which was the case before. Also, uh, liability for negligence was introduced for certain uh, sexual offenses, like rape. Um, and the reform was introduced after several years of powerful campaigning from the women's movement and also the wider feminist movement in Sweden. So we saw that especially uh, girls and young women were engaged in this struggle and the organization FATTA was uh, instrumental. So, Together we uh, met with politicians, um, we uh, joined up with um, influential lawyers and researchers, and we organized big uh, manifestations all over Sweden. So this was a bit of a, a foretaste for the Me Too movement that was still uh, just around the corner. Uh, in 2020, the Swedish uh, National Council for Crime Prevention, BRÅ, review the application of the new consent-based legislation. And they found that um, the number of reports, uh, prosecutions and convictions of rape had increased since the law was changed. The number of convictions increased from 190 in 2017 to 333 in 2019. So that's an increase of 75%. Um, Bro also found, which was perhaps even more important, that several cases that previously would not have resulted in uh, prosecution and or conviction now did. So, for example, um, there were instances where the victim remained passive during the assault and without verbally or physically expressing her lack of consent that led to uh, conviction. There were also several cases in which uh, sexual intercourse had begun as consensual and then become, became non-consensual. For example, when um, the man suddenly became physically rough or performed certain acts that the woman uh, did not want to participate in. And many of these new cases that came before the courts uh, took place in party settings and involved young women and men that had been flirting with each other earlier in the evening. So that was very important. Uh, before and since the introduction of the new law, public agencies such as Chattas Bro and also women's organizations and other NGOs have worked uh, intensively to build what we call a consent-based culture. So this includes putting together materials and training teachers and other professionals that 
interact with children. Also, the sexuality education is being reformed to put more emphasis on consent. And we've also seen several programs and efforts to educate judiciaries and police officers and others. So, as you can hear, the Swedish Women's Lobby is a strong supporter of our consent-based legislation. And we want to congratulate Finland for being about to introduce a similar legislation. So if sex is uh, not consensual for everyone involved, it's not sex anymore. It is simply rape, uh, which is a serious criminal offense. But all that being said, Sweden, like the rest of the world, is far away from being able to protect women and girls, uh, holding perpetrators accountable and restoring justice when it comes to sexual offenses. In Sweden, we still have near impunity for sexual offences. Only 5% of reported rapes lead to conviction. And we see that often the police investigations are not nearly as thorough as they need to be. Only half of the reported cases, the, uh, a suspected perpetrator is being questioned. We see that the police need training and more resources, both money and personnel that can be earmarked for working with sexual violence. In the last uh, few years, we have seen an increase in sexual violence against girls and young women, and especially online. So the law is being updated to make sure that all those uh, crimes are covered, uh, but we are lagging behind. We also see that schools and teachers, despite the efforts that have been made, are not always well equipped to talk about consent and especially not to have those uh, difficult uh, conversations that arises when you dig deeper into what consent really means. So, for example, we need to talk to girls and boys about what you can consent to and also what you cannot consent to. For example, you cannot consent to violence. You cannot pay for someone's consent. That's prostitution and so on. Um, and when it comes to educating children and youth about consent, it is also a must to mention pornography. So boys in Sweden begin watching pornography when they are on average 12 years old. Probably it's something similar in Finland. And 41% of young men in Sweden, they watch pornography daily or several times a week. And what they often see are images that sexualizes violence and humiliation of women. Often pornography eroticizes the very lack of consent. So everything we do as a community is um, have to balance that. Um, and girls shelters in Sweden, they testify that girls ask them if it is normal to be strangled uh, during sex. So that is also an idea that has originated from pornography. And when I hear about that, I realize that we are, despite all that has been done and the legislation that we have, uh, very far away still from a consent-based culture. So that was my introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Clara, for this very interesting presentation. I think um, we will come back to uh, the idea of consent-based culture that you mentioned. Um, our third panelist uh, is by the Karnista. And um, you are the chief of peace and security at UN Women. And we know that uh, conflict situations increase sexual violence and women's organizations have recently been very concerned of the situation uh, in Afghanistan, for example, in this respect. And now, of course, all eyes are on the war in Ukraine. So how can we ensure that women have a say over their own bodies also during conflict? Thank you very much. I'm very proud to be with uh, Helvi Sipila seminar. And nice to see familiar faces or of familiar names, at least on the screen. So indeed, I will focus on conflict and crisis situations. And uh, as, as I'm sure all of you know, uh, women's bodies have become uh, the battle crown and uh, sexual violence is used as a weapon of war. And that doesn't only harm uh, those who, are, uh, who experience sexual violence, it actually uh, violates the whole society, families, the, the very essence of the situation. 
um, and uh, sexual violence is actually an easy weapon to use in war, low cost, and uh, it actually seems to be linked to massive displacement. So you can, this threat of sexual violence can clear big areas of, for example, villages, farmland uh, to be occupied by those who are uh, perpetrating sexual violence. Sexual violence is often addressed as part of a humanitarian response, providing services to survivors and in peace and security context as part of a protection when it has been seen that there have been attacks against villages, communities. At UN Women, we are convinced that the best way to address sexual violence is actually to prevent it from happening in the very first instance. And addressing gender inequality as a root cause of violence against women and violence in general is about prevention. Actually, data shows that states that have higher levels of gender equality are less likely to resort to the use of force. Data also shows that higher levels of uh, gender-based violence linked to higher risk of conflict. So prevention of sexual violence is not an easy task. So we, it needs concrete measures focusing on prevention, mitigation and response. We believe that in peace and security, in humanitarian, as well as in so-called normal development contexts, we need to ensure that women themselves, including survivors of sexual violence, could participate in planning, decision-making, implementation, and also benefit from results, and that financing is channeled to women. Here, I would also like to say now that many countries around the world are receiving refugees. I'm also hoping that the refugees are heard uh, on sexual violence issues. And uh, it's known that if they have faced sexual violence or that they are at risk, of sexual violence and these issues are addressed. We are promoting, so like I said, we are promoting uh, gender uh, equality, including social and economic empowerment, access to uh, rule of law and justice, supporting um, appropriate legislation and uh, promoting women's leadership. You know, as you have, you have heard these elements already mentioned also, in context of Finland and uh, Sweden, for example. UN Women itself is working in these areas and working with other UN entities and member states to remind them of their responsibility to be inclusive and to, to take this into account. And we are also working as part of the UN action on sexual violence in, in conflict. Maybe I, I'd like to mention a few issues also um, especially about, um, I'm not going into a wider gender equality work, which is very much uh, at the core of also preventing violence against women and sexual violence. I want to specifically focus now on uh, justice and reparations. And uh, UN Women is working together with Justice Rapid Response, deploying gender experts and sexual and gender-based violence experts to uh, international accountability mechanisms, such as OHHR commissions of inquiry, fact-finding missions, ICC, so that uh, any crimes can be investigated. We have actually deployed more than 100 investigators and advisors, as, like I said, as part of uh, joint UN systems, including Afghanistan, Syria, etc. Also, impunity for sexual violence is widespread. There have been some positive developments in recent years that give us hope. Uh, conviction of several former military officers uh, in Guatemala and, and the establishment of a reparations program in Kosovo that has registered more than 1,000 survivors of conflict-related sexual violence. And I want to say that uh, something like 10 years ago in another role, 
I was working with Kosovo and the story there was, oh, we didn't have any sexual violence in conflict at all in Kosovo, it's not in our culture. And that was repeated equally by international actors, but as well as local ones. So we have come from, uh, from there. Reparations to, for victims and survivors can be a very powerful form of justice, and especially for those who have been stigmatized by their communities and families and who suffer long lasting mental and physical harm. So maybe I, I can see that my time is more or less up here. So um, I wanted to say that uh, also uh, there are many other mechanisms to which to address sexual violence issues. It should be part of anything we do. And we have, for example, the Women, Peace, Security and Humanitarian Action Compact, as well as uh, action coalitions but, uh, on generation equality that address uh, violence and sexual violence. So I'm hoping that together, I'm really happy that this uh, seminar is focusing on uh, sexual violence and violence against women. And also you invited the aspect of conflict and uh, crisis situations. It's getting, um, it is the area where we need action and addressing right now and every day in these situations. And very happy that the, this Helvi Sipilas legacy is continued this day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peggy, for this very topical address and also outlining the kind of dual role of legislation in prevention as well as in, in reparations, both very important roles. So our topic today is, uh, is legislation, consent and women's rights, and we have uh, heard now quite a lot about consent-based legislative reforms and, and how the laws look like if we want to ensure that it upholds women's human rights. Um, but then how about the, the practice and the implementation and uh, the enforcing of the legislation? And we know that that, that is um, something of a question in many countries. And uh, certainly there has been a lot of discussion uh, about this lately in Finland as, as well. Um, and this is, of course, a major uh, question in, in post-conflict and conflict situations as well. So um, what can we to do to um, ensure that uh, these fancy concept-based legislative reforms are not just paper tigers, but they actually change the lives of, of the actual women on the ground? What kind of uh, role do you see, for example, education playing here? I think that uh, that this was already uh, a little bit covered by by our panelists. Puya mentioned that that sex is not discussed in India; that women are taught to be submissive, and and Clara was talking about the the constant based culture, and that is very important. That maybe maybe also mentioned the, the deploying of gender experts, which can be um, all I guess. Um, uh, kind of ex examples of of uh, the role of education that is um, that is indeed important in um, in implementing these legislative reforms. But is there something that you would like to add uh, on this implementing side? Uh, perhaps uh, we can take a round uh, of short comments, and and uh, maybe Clara would like to uh, start since you already kind of began on the subject. Uh, was that a question for me? Sorry. It was a general question for everybody, but okay. I was wondering Sorry, whether you would like to, to go <laughs> first because you already uh, kind of begun on, on the implementation side as well. Um, so the question was how to succeed with implementation. Yes. So I think that, um, as I mentioned, um, um, training and education, both for, you know, um, children and, and schools is of course fundamental, but also all parts of the uh, judicial system um, and the, the police force, um, judiciaries, um, lawyers, um, and that all those trainings need to be very systematic because um, what we can see in, 
in Sweden is that we've had a lot of um, well-meaning and important projects, but what's lacking is that's really, you know, enough uh, resources and systematic work just to make sure that, okay, all children um, in grade six have gotten this information. All of them had had that, um, you know, um, deep conversation about what consent really means with their teacher before they graduate that year. You know, it's that sort of, I think, very uh, systematic um, uh, information campaign, public campaign that we need to see. So um, that's, that's probably what I would like to stress. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Systematic, I think, is the key word there, and that is indeed important. Um, um, Baby, would you like to go next? Okay. So thank you for the implementation. What I could say that, well, it was first mentioned here, of course, that the, it's governments who are responsible for ensuring that the rights are fulfilled and uh, also the international applications such as CEDO get implemented and, uh, and so I'm hoping for example you know in your own countries I'm hoping you keep your governments uh, you know aware that this is expected but also in collaboration with other countries this should be part of a bilateral international discussions regional organizations such as African Union have done quite impressive frameworks for the whole region to ensure that everybody follows uh, certain standards. And uh, then on, uh, I mentioned already that really implementing gender equality and uh, eliminating, uh, eliminating uh, the inequalities in legislation, in, uh, in uh, health systems, in education systems, from societies. Of course, we now have a problem, but because of COVID, many girls and boys, but especially girls dropped out of school altogether. So, uh, you know, important to get uh, girls to school, get education, so that one day they are empowered also to, you know, fight for their rights and demand for their rights and demand that from, uh, from their societies. So maybe, maybe I'll stop here. Thanks. Thank you. That means that the very comprehensive approach is really needed for implementation because it goes through uh, all the, um, uh, all the um, governmental um, kind of silos. It cannot be only the Minister of Justice who implements the legislation. It needs to be the education system and it needs to be the health system and it needs to be the whole society that is somehow involved. Uh, Puya, would you like to comment as well on the implementation question? Thank you, uh, Mirha. So yes, uh, to point out to what my co-panelists have said that it's very important for the government to focus on uh, uh, the implementations of legislations. And we also have to focus that in a country like India, where the civil society is in a very strong position and very well spread out and has been able to cover a lot of geographical barriers as well by rooting uh, regional organizations and grassroots um, um, CBOs and NGOs, uh, the government has to like take that as a, a very, um, uh, very much as a support and involve civil society organizations in, in, the, in the implementation of these legislations. Uh, also on top of that, we have to work on um, appointing and the training of um, the people who are actually looking at implementation and who are like, for example, program managers and grassroots coordinators who are going from uh, town to town or city to city to see if the implementation is actually taking place. 
to for them to have proper trainings and proper sensitization so that they they when they are going into the um, into the fields and seeing if uh, implementation is taking place properly that they do not bring back uh, uh, fabricated information and or are uh, mis misinforming uh, people about a specific uh, scheme or act that they uh, uh, can avail and we have to focus again on training um, the uh, training all um, uh, workers on uh, basic uh, uh, understanding of women's rights and human rights because i think that is what is missing that we do not talk about what we actually uh, have in terms of rights and what does our legislation um, uh, rewards us as citizens of a country so we have to start from the very basic we have to we cannot start from uh, the um, uh, a conversation that begins in the middle because that creates even more uh, 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 judgments and the and uh, and then there is um, a pushback from the community in terms of that they would not want to be part of such trainings so we have to keep that in focus very like whenever we are planning such implementation processes thank you thank you uh, that is actually a very important point that we do need information uh, on the implementation on the ground and whether it's working and whether uh, it's not working and and what is happening in different parts of the country which can be of course also very different things and um, it is important to ensure that uh, that the legislation is implemented similarly everywhere. Um, perhaps then um, a little bit about other um, other things that are needed in in addition to legislation to to ensure that women can enjoy their bodily integrity. Um, we know that uh, that. Uh, Prevention is, is, of course, the first thing that Bailey, Bailey was already mentioning that. And um, uh, we know that legislation has also a, a very important role uh, to play in, in uh, this regard. Is there anything else that we can do regarding, um, uh, regarding prevention of sexual violence uh, else than legislation, uh, legislative work? And, and how about then um, um, ensuring quality services, accessible services, also for those who have um, um, encountered sexual violence, what what should we do to ensure that, that everybody receives the support that they, they will need in that situation? Um, Ibaibi, would you like to start? Thank you. And I'll I'll probably repeat now what I also said, but I think women's participation is the key here. Women need to be part because often, often the plans, processes, mechanisms are planned without women themselves being part of that. And especially women who are at the focus of this. So consult women, include women, Make sure women are part of the leadership positions. But for example, in humanitarian response plans, only in half, not, you know, there are only half of humanitarian response plans ever consult women before assessing what are the needs. In uh, peacekeeping uh, missions, don't necessarily consult women when they set up a mission in a country. Um, programs and policies are planned without women. So my, my main uh, thing is make sure women participate, women lead, women, women are able to contribute and women are also benefiting from the systems and make whoever is doing this accountable. For example, if, uh, if a country is funding United Nations, make sure that United Nations organization is delivering on this. It's not enough to write gender in the document and say it's taken care of, but make sure there, is, uh, there, is, uh, there are resources and measurements for this purpose. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Puya, would you like to continue? Um. Yes, thank you. Uh, 
So continuing what Paivi said that uh, we have to make sure that women are in leadership positions. Uh, so I would want to like point out an example as to how this can work. For, so in YWCA India, we have a program called the Rise Up program, which is in collaboration with World YWCA. We have uh, World YWCA and YWCA India has made sure that uh, all leadership positions in that program are gathered by young women. Young women also not from a specific age bracket, from but various um, ages, uh, starting from as young as uh, uh, 19, 20 to going on to as 35, 40, to have that varied intergenerational experience and to have that knowledge and um, have uh, resources of uh, shared experiences and learnings. And um, so we have made sure that the program, which is spread out from uh, the uh, from the, our uh, capital city to the grassroots uh, in like a rural, uh, uh, sorry, rural locations in uh, that has spread out all throughout the country. We have made sure that everywhere where is a leadership position that is acquired by a young woman who is a representative from that specific uh, uh, geographical location or um, um, that minority because representation is also what is important we have to understand that even when we talk about sexual violence sexual violence uh, experiences spread out uh, and we have to take into account the uh, context of the caste class uh, consciousness that does not exist in our um, uh, in our societies and a lot and a lot of times uh, sexual violence cases are seen through these uh, barriers of caste and class and thus they go um, misheard and misrepresented and uh, misrepresented so we have to be very conscious about the fact that when we are talking about uh, sexual violence and experiences we have to be inclusive we have to be inclusive within our country within our country's context because uh, with as much diversity we get more and more uh, experiences we get more knowledge about what needs to be uh, addressed in a legislation. We have to be um, uh, inclusive of everybody's needs. And uh, how are how do these then act upon, um, uh, like, for example, generational trauma? Because it goes, if like, if we kept, keep on uh, dismissing uh, experiences of violence against women of a specific community or a specific minority background, they, it does build on generational trauma that uh, is passed on uh, through uh, like various generations of children. Yeah, so that's what I wanted to add. Thanks. Clara, do you have any thoughts? Um, yes, so we're talking a little bit now about um, gender equality and, um, and representation, but if, if it's all right with you, I would like to um, get back to per perhaps uh, narrowing in on uh, sexual violence and, and consent-based legislation. So as you mentioned, we have talked a bit about um, prevention and prosecution and uh, in, uh, in the Istanbul Convention about uh, domestic violence and sexual violence, there are four P's. So that's the prevention and prosecution, but also um, protection and policies. And um, something that we have not yet talked about is the support for um, victims, mostly women and girls that have experienced uh, sexual violence and uh, rape and other types of sexual violence, which is, of course, uh, hugely important. And um, that includes um, having um, women's and girls shelters that can provide, a, you know, um, in some cases, even, you know, life saving protections from perpetrator, but also uh, a lot of those shelters they do, they have um, chat rooms or they have a phone, a phone line, that you, a hotline that you can call and um, they provide uh, legal aid and they do such an important work uh, helping those women and girls. And, and it's important for um, the governments uh, of each country to make sure that the women's and girls shelters that they have long-term finding and that they have good uh, conditions that make it possible for them to work. So for example, in Sweden, we have a long history, a women's shelter movement that has 
been very stable and worked sometimes almost underground for a long time. Um, but still, it's um, we have so many examples of shelters that are struggling to survive and to make ends needs uh, meet um, today. Um, but also support for um, victims of violence uh, includes also care. So many uh, victims of sexual violence are in need of health care, uh, trauma care, care both um, acute trauma care and also, of course, sometimes physical care that should also be, you know, a part of that uh, care should be also securing um, possible uh, forensics that you would need uh, in, in a later care uh, case. But that uh, trauma care, both acute and long term to help, because sometimes the, the, the experience of sexual violence can be, you know, a lifelong trauma that uh, prevents women from uh, working, supporting themselves, it can affect all of their lives. So what's lacking in many countries and also in Sweden is that uh, knowledge and skills and possibility for um, healthcare to provide necessarily these uh, means but the victims of sexual violence needs. So that also needs to be improved, I think, in Sweden and in many other countries. For sure. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that is also very important. Let's uh, keep in mind all the P's. Um, as the very last question, um, I would like to ask you about cooperation. We've uh, outlined a great many issues that, that need to be uh, somehow achieved. And um, as Mary said, states are mainly responsible for implementing these international requirements. But of course, we as NGOs uh, and international NGOs have a, uh, have a big role in ensuring that states do indeed live up to those um, uh, those proposals, uh, promises that they have made on these issues, and um, um, would you have any any <laughs> any last thoughts on on how we can actually um, make sure that we are strong enough? Uh, we uh, how can we build partnerships so that we can ensure that that indeed we can make this change? We can ensure that states do make this change, and we can ensure also that there is. Uh, representation of, of all different women on the tables, as uh, as Puya uh, was mentioning. And also there was a question uh, from the chat, uh, how do we include men in this discussion? Is there a way to also build partnerships with, uh, with um, the wider civil society, not just women's organizations? Uh, I don't know if we have any um, volunteers now to <laughs> start the last round. Baby, go ahead. <laughs> if you don't mind, I can go. And I don't need to repeat what I said about governments and their responsibility. You are right. Civil society is crucially important here. And um, what I want to say that we need, really need to make sure, and after COVID, after all these conflicts and crises around the world, we really need to make sure women's civil society survives and, uh, and is supported. This needs funding, and in addition to funding, in many countries have legislation that, that prevents women's civil society from operating. So we need also, uh, attention to not only rights of women, but also rights of women's organizations. And there needs to be funding. In conflict situations, women's organizations get 0.2% of funding going to the ODA, going to uh, those areas. And they do such a crucial work. And women need, women's organizations need support for their own work, not to implement somebody else's priorities. So wanted to say that one. And one more thing there is women's organizations and those who are working there, the women's human rights defenders need protection and they need to be uh, uh, focused on those who are promoting women's rights, need to be there so that they can do their work. And yes, the role of men is very important, but I would like to say partly it comes because it's mostly men in decision-making roles, in positions of power. They are already there as part of this process. 
So indeed, it is a question how to get, uh, get them engaged. And this doesn't mean that men wouldn't be victims also in, in cases, but that's the power situation. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Karapuya. <laughs> I can say something um, Go ahead. shortly. Um, so, of course, the importance of the women's movement um, and um, women's organizations and girls' organizations cannot be underestimated. And I think it's the case in Sweden and probably in, in Finland as well, so that all uh, big, important gender equality reforms uh, and women's rights reforms is the result of um, the push and the struggle of the women's movement. So that is of course important and it's important with cooperations between women's organizations in our countries, but also uh, in between countries. So as I said, our, our experience in Sweden was that we could join forces with different organizations, but also with um, scholars and um, legal academics uh, to help us um, in, in our arguments and building up the, the case for consent-based legislation. So that was very important. And we had also lots of like cultural activities and, uh, and stuff that was very important for building the movement and the momentum. So um, cooperation between different civil society sectors, really, I would say is very important. And also uh, between different um, women's organizations in different countries. So hopefully that you can look at the evaluation that we have um, done in Sweden uh, when it comes to our consent based legislations and you can um, use that in your arguments and you can also try to make make the law even better than the one that we have. So I would say that's really important and you can always uh, come to us and we will try to help you um, as best we can. Um, and about, um, lastly, about involving uh, men and boys. Uh, I would like to put an emphasis also on boys. Uh, I think that's very important and, um, um, any, and that's the only way to prevent um, violence and sexual violence against women and girls is by uh, changing, getting men and boys to change their behavior. So that's of course uh, instrumental. Thank you. Thank you, Cara. Puya, you have last words as, as Alice. Yes, so I would like to uh, put forward an example of uh, the cooperation of uh, civil society organizations, of women's rights organizations. So September 2021, um, 75 plus of women's rights organizations in India um, uh, observed 25 years of a campaign called the Women's Reservation Bill, which has been uh, campaigned by, uh, by uh, largely mostly uh, women's rights and human rights organizations who demand for a 33% reservation of women in the parliament which obviously leads to more women, women's representation and um, uh, it leads to more uh, women's voices in when legislative um, uh, documents are being prepared. Uh, the legislation or like the parliament has rejected the bill four times um, by now but uh, the women's reservation bill or the movement is presenting it for the fifth time again next year and it's it's uh, it's a celebration and it is the strength that we can have that for 25 years yes there have been ups and downs and there has been a, a pandemic and they and people do get discouraged of such a long engagement but we have to remember that uh, they can push us as much as we want uh, as much as they want but we we will keep uh, pushing for our rights and we and the 75 plus organizations are not just organizations who are only working in gender rights or child rights but they are organizations that feel women's rights is a, a, a priority concern and has to be um, addressed in the in the parliament and in our uh, legislative changes so that was one of the examples that did come into my mind when we were talking about partnerships and uh, cooperations a uh, uh, cooperation amongst uh, ngos so i wanted to point that out again uh, i would um, 
agree with my co-panelist Clara when she said that um, working with young boys and men is uh, uh, very much important and it is uh, it is one of the most uh, important ways in which we can actually address uh, um, uh, prevention of sexual violence because um, inherently we have been brought up in a society where um, yeah, boys have been taught that they hold more power than the girls of their family and thus big begins the journey and the cycle of trauma and sexual violence so we have to and we have to address that yes it's it's embedded in our uh, culture and it has it it is more of a habit so we have to start working on um, making them understand that habits can change and societies can change and we can improve so that were my closing remarks thank you very much very good words to close the panel and uh, thank you very much uh, for, for the panelists. Now we are reaching the end of the program and a uh, very interesting and important discussion it has been. Um, it will be wrapped up by um, Fatim Diara, uh, the chairperson of the Coalition of Finance Women's Associations, MITKIS. Thank you so much, uh, Merya. Uh, nice to see you and also nice to see everyone else and and i'm really happy that so many of you have decided to participate in this seminar this year um and hello my name is fatim diarras was just said and i am the chairperson of the, of the women's organization nutkis and hello from the town hall of helsinki i'm also the chairperson of the city council of helsinki so hello from helsinki it's cold but spring is is still coming um, thank you so much for all the speakers and especially to you who participated in this extremely in interesting panel debate. Um, I, I couldn't agree more with everything that was just, just said in the panel debate. And, and I would, but I would still like to emphasize something. I strongly believe that we still live in this culture of harassment and in this culture of sexual violence. And this is not so much that it would be something that happens in one country, but something that we can see cross countries and cross continents. I myself come from background of, of uh, my mother is Finnish and my father is from Mali, from West Africa. And, and we have similar problems in different forms uh, in both of these countries that are quite far away from each other. Still same kind of attitudes and same kind of discrimination happens. Um, this is not a, prob an, a national problem of any country, but something that is in, in the way, in the role that we give women in this, in this world. Um, something that shows us that, women, that the women's experience of, of how, how it is to be and how it is to, is to live as a woman uh, is still not heard or respected. I will tell you one, one, one clear example. Um, uh, last year, in, in Instagram in, and in other social media, uh, there was this um, picture that people were sharing where it was only the text, uh, text me when you get home. And, and many women shared this text and said that this ex I, I know this experience. This is what I do if I go out with my friends. I always tell to my friend, to a woman when she's leaving, text me when you get home. Something that we women think that it's just normal to do because we are taught to be afraid and we know that something might happen. And, and this came as a shock to many men who asked, do you really do this? Do you really feel that this is necessary? And this is just a, such a small practical example that shows us how women's experience and how our, uh, the way we live is not understood and how, how our reality is still not seen. Um, but uh, I would like to emphasize also that, that the fact uh, that, that the way we can solve these problems is by changing the culture, uh, the, moving away from the culture of harassment and moving away from the culture of violence. And from my perspective, I strongly believe that we are strongest when we work together and, and when women's organizations work together, I was so happy that um, that um, Paivi Kannista raised, raised the topic of, um, of the financial situation of women's organization. If we don't support enough the women's organization, the work cannot be done. 
So, so this is something crucial, and this is something that especially us who are in a position of a decision maker uh, have to have to have to have to fight for. Because, as someone just said earlier, women's rights have not been given to us. They are something that uh, women's organizations and women activists have 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 done, have worked for, and have fought for. And that is something that we have to continue. And I, and I strongly believe that it's our responsibility. Sometimes I almost feel that as a, as a young feminist that I came to a set table and just started eating. Uh, but uh, but, um, but uh, it makes it even more important that, that we have to uh, continue fighting and, and working because we are not yet there. Something that I would also like to mention, I know that I don't have a lot of time, but I still want to say this. Uh, one um, um, important leader who I respect a lot, uh, member of the European Par Parliament, Sirpa Pietikainen, said uh, last summer to me that, hey, Fatim, do you, do you, you know this Me Too thing? I was like, yes. Uh, she said, I hate it when people say that Me Too hasn't, hasn't gone, that Me Too has gone too far, because Me Too hasn't even really started yet. And I agree with this. We have only scratched the topic of the problems that we have. And, and, but when I look at all the women activists around the world, all the organization, all the feminists and all the movement uh, that is going on, I strongly believe that in cooperation, we can truly solve these problems and we, we, can, we can fix them. But it, it takes a lot of work. But after listening to you guys speaking today, uh, it is clear that we are already ready for the work that has to be done. And it has to be done because equally, if work for equality is also work for peace. In these word, words, I would like to thank you all uh, for participating in this seminar and wish you a, a, a great uh, week. Although we do live in an extremely uh, horrible situation, but it also reminds us that working for equality and working for peace is today uh, even more important than it was yesterday. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Fatim. Uh, those are very good words in this webinar, and we have indeed come to the end of our discussion. Thank you very much for all the participants. Thank you very much for all the speakers, especially. Um, and I hope that you have enjoyed the event. Please take a minute to give us feedback. The link will appear in the chat. And have a nice evening. And of course, happy International Women's Day tomorrow. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.